Yes, so thank you for giving me the opportunity uh, to speak here. Um, this is about situations of inner source software development where you need special solutions, an obscure topic called transfer pricing, and how we get there. So I don't think I need to explain inner source here. It's open source best practices inside a company. And the reasons for it are plenty. There are many good reasons. But one important reason, of course, is that we want to get better, faster, cheaper code reuse. Yeah? So if we share more code, um, it get if we reuse more code, that code matures faster, which means better quality because bugs are discovered faster. Uh, development gets faster because you reuse uh, code. And similarly, then you get freed up from doing basic components over and over again. So in general, it gets cheaper or you get freed up to do more stuff again faster. So that all is a great promise and lots of experience reports show us how inner source can get give that to us but it's not always easy so let me try to drill into that and where the very good idea of code reuse hits some boundaries and what we can do about it to still make inner source happen where outside forces might try to stop you so uh, code reuse obviously then means there's some separate piece of code, a library, a component that has multiple users. If there are not multiple users, there's not a lot of reuse, arguably. So this, it's a common structure, let's say three apps using one library. Now that quickly grows if it works well, and you'll have multiple libraries and multiple users and what results is often called a platform. So in the simplest case, a collection of libraries, often a platform is much more processes. Um, the research literature talks about application engineering processes and domain engineering processes, where the domain engineering processes are about understanding what's that shared functionality that all the apps want and turning that into the reusable components, the libraries. Um, there has been a lot of research 20, 25 years on platform engineering, product line engineering, and most of the literature, basically all, has one thing in common. It argues that for those shared components, the platform, you need a dedicated organization, a group of people which develops that platform and provides it to the apps. Turns out, that's obviously not in a source, turns out in the original literature, um, people 25 years ago already talked about virtual organizations where the people developing the platform would not necessarily have to belong to one org unit. So why is that relevant? Well, let's take a look at one of our cases that we worked with in the past. That was a large German electronics software component, something uh, developer, and it was split into multiple business units. So it was actually multiple separate companies, one serving industries, one serving regular enterprise customers, one serving consumers, and they had very different products, but they wanted code reuse based on inner source where they realized what they needed was a safe and secure Linux kernel that would do that job in all these different products that they were selling. Now, the question comes, that's great that you want to collaborate using inner source, but who owns the code? Uh, how is it developed? And that is not obvious if there is a business boundary in between because these different managers of the security and server and router solutions, they really belong to different business units. The shared boss who could tell them, let's go in our source is very high up, very far away. And so they would naturally quibble about who owns it, et cetera. We'll also quickly see in a second how this is a legal problem. But let me just stay for a second with the company internal social managerial issues here. So we have to ask um, who owns it, um, who owns the copyright, because again, it's different businesses, and how is it being developed? You can split it up in my book in following these uh, 
two dimensions, ownership and development. And there is the traditional setup where you say, okay, one of the business units uh, becomes the owner. And that naturally then essential development because they develop it as well. And then they provide it as a service to other folks. So it's kind of central, dedicated, centrally, de centrally owned by developed by a dedicated organization. And that's not what we're interested in. We're interested in, of course, if these three businesses, these three different business units collaborate. The question also becomes, so they share jointly develop it. Still, you have to ask who owns it. And there are obviously two models. It can be centrally owned. So all the copyright to the code belongs to one of the business units. You don't need legal backing for that, but you can make one of the business units the owner. Call it a hub and spoke model here. Or you can try to share it using a peer-to-peer -peer model. By far, well, all examples we have seen is companies choose a hub and spoke uh, inner source model so they make one organization the owner and uh, then have have legal agreements in place how how to collaborate around across these business boundaries so that's the managerial setup it gets more complicated here's another company we looked at and it's a multinational uh, financial services organization so it's present in many different countries, which are the country organizations, Hong Kong, UK, US. And the example here is the mobile banking app. Obviously, these apps, you can really see it when you look at them, uh, must be 80%, 90% the same code, and then some country-specific layer on top. So there's a base app, 80% of the code, and then the customizations for the different uh, countries. The country organizations are naturally also independent business units. So a boundary runs in between, even a physical country boundary. And that also means it's a tax boundary. Now that, if you haven't looked at that in the past, may sound obscure. Why would you care about a tax boundary specifically? In this case here, it was there's also a tax boundary, but it's the same country. Here, it's even different countries in between the different country organizations and the different business units. So the reason is that as soon as something valuable intellectual property like source code flows across a tax boundary, like you do an inner source code sharing across these country organization boundaries, uh, you need to account for it and it needs to be paid for because it goes from one business to another business. So there need to be compensation payments, which are commonly called transfer prices. The tax authorities are very closely looking at it. So the uh, UK and US tax authorities will very closely look at the financial services example, um, how the IP flows between these two different companies and who benefits. Um, if you do not properly account for it, you may be held liable for tax evasion. Um, that's kind of obvious in the European Union, where there are some countries which have lower corporate taxes. So magically, all the profit of companies who are multinationals, all the profits occurs in that particular country. And there's zero profit in the other countries, which the other countries do not like because they want their taxes too. So they are very critical about the internal accounting and require proper accounting for the business value, the economic value of the intellectual property, the source code that ultimately makes the company's money in the market in one form or another. It's actually an old problem. It's not a new problem, uh, transfer pricing. There are rules for international uh, collaboration, so across country boundaries that are tax boundaries, provided to by the OECD for us. They have five different models that you can pick to get a better idea of how to account and price um, price your um, uh, the, the value of the intellectual property you're sharing across the tax boundaries. Local governments, meaning country government or uh, tax authorities often adopt these OECD recommendations. I have another talk on the web where I go into a bit more detail there. Here I won't, but I want to say that there are two categories in these five methods. It's either cost-based, 
where the transfer prices of the source code that flows across a tax boundary is purely based on the costs of creating it. But it can also be revenue-based, meaning the recipient of the source code, what do they make of it? And the profits or the revenues that accrue from it may have to be shared with those who does the original development of some of this in another country. So um, as I said, this is actually not so new. Transfer pricing has been around for a while and companies have solutions for it. Um, I'm slowly making my way back to Inasos. Um, the traditional solution is to have a simple client, have an organization where you have a subsidiary in another country, typically lower labor cost country, which does development for the main headquarter in a different country. And so every six months, you get a component shipped. That's more like a traditional client supplier relationship. So I think many companies, if they woke up to the transfer pricing problem, I hope they all did, um, have some very coarse grain accounting for this. The properties of this situation are the source code only flows in one direction from the subsidiary to the headquarter. And it's fairly low frequency, meaning every six months. Now, inner source software development really changes that because it's not one way any longer. The source code flows in all directions. Everyone participates because everyone also wants to benefit. Participation and contribution to inner source projects is like an open source, a way to maintain your dependency on the source code, on the component, so that uh, it doesn't go in a way that you don't want to. So source code flows in all directions. Everyone pays in with source code. Everyone takes out by using. And also, it happens many times a day. The commits are just flying. Well, frequency may vary, but it's not every six months. It's just many more, much more often. And uh, working with the German tax authorities, it's clear that we need better and more specific transfer pricing models than have been applied to the traditional client-supplier relationship. So that's what we are working on. Here is an illustration. Um, we have, uh, so we, meaning the MECO IS uh, team at the University of Erlangen, uh, have been working on getting a handle on transfer pricing. This applies both to the basic level of pricing every single commit, at least in terms of costs. So what labor costs were needed to create that particular piece of code. But on top of that, putting all of this into a framework that works for internal accounting, that works for financial compliance at your company, and that works for the tax authorities of your company. Where basically, um, we look at it from a tax perspective, uh, we calculate the base price, but we see how many different parties are both contributing originally and using. So here in this illustration, you can see how the uh, users are um, contributing, uh, how the users are using, how the usage value is split, and how it leads to reimbursement for the uh, contributors. And uh, that is an accounting model, so on a higher level than valuing each individual commit. So this is part of our project, the Mikoias project. Uh, the overarching goal here is to, well, let's have a slogan, uh, to bring business intelligence to engineering management using what salespeople have to drill down on their data, business intelligence to bring this to engineering. And transfer pricing is uh, one of the solutions we have here are working on. Others are input-based productivity metrics as well as outcome-based impact measurement. And it all really is joined at the hip because the data flows into each other and you need all of it for the others as well. So it's kind of growing. Uh, it's derived, it's empirical, it's quantitative. Um, so it leads to specific numbers like the compensation payments, transfer prices you may have to pay to a different country within your multinational and that's it.
So that's us. Um, to the left, you can see my three PhD students. So right now it says master there, soon PhD. And me, that's the MakeYS team. And with that, I close. Thank you for your time and attention. And maybe we'll have time for questions.